Good day. Welcome to another episode of the Audible Local Ledger Reads to the Blind podcast. You can get more information at audiblelocalledger.org. Stay tuned for today's reading. Hi, my name's Eric. I'll be reading you selections from the e-edition of today's Cape Cod Times dated April 1st of 2024. No need to worry, we'll pull no April Fool's pranks during this reading. But we will start with the weather across the Cape and Islands. We have an interesting week ahead of us. Today, mainly cloudy, high of 49 during the day, and tonight, a low of 39, also cloudy. But tomorrow and Wednesday, we have some weather coming. On Tuesday, it'll be a high of 45, a low of 38 in the overnight, cloudy with a little rain later in the afternoon. But on Wednesday, increasingly windy with rain and uh, p- p- perhaps a bit of a nor'easter coming in on Wednesday. High of 42, low of 40. It'll be a wet day for sure, Tuesday night into Wednesday. Thursday, cloudy and windy with showers in places. And Friday, cloudy and breezy with a shower in spots. Both days, highs of 45, lows of 37 in the overnight. So uh, the middle of the week looks to be very windy, rainy, and um, basically uh, April showers. Sunrise today was at 6.23 a.m. It'll set at 7.07 p.m. We'll have 12 hours, 44 minutes of daylight. Heading to the front of the paper where the lottery results and news are kept. And we read the lottery results because, well, somebody asked for them. If there's something you would like read to the blind or people who are print disabled, you can email us at info at audiblelocalledger.org or call us at 508 539-2030, and we'll consider reading it. And if you miss any of the information that we share, you can always go to audiblelocalledger.org, and in the upper right corner is the Archived Readings tab. Click on that, and you'll find a week's worth of our newspaper readings that you can catch up on. And the Literature Readings tab will find a wide variety of uh, fiction and nonfiction literature for your listening pleasure that stays up there in perpetuity. All that's free for people who are blind or print disabled at audiblelocalledger.org. For the latest lottery results, we go to masslottery.com because the Cape Cod Times goes to press too early to give you the latest results. And if you ask for them, you certainly deserve the latest results. So for the numbers game of Sunday, March 31st of 2024, in the midday drawing yesterday, the numbers were 4844. Again, yesterday's midday numbers game drawing, 4844. Last night's drawing for Sunday, March 31st of the numbers game, the results were 4622. Again, last night's numbers game for Sunday, March 31st, the evening drawing, 4622. Mass cash results for last night, Sunday, March 31st, 1, 3, 5, 7, 23. And Lucky for Life finishes up our lottery results for Sunday, March 31st with 1, 4, 13, 26, and 27 with 1, the bonus number. Good luck to all who play. Remember us if you win. From the Cape Cod Times front page, the headline reads, Such a tremendous person. Former U.S. Representative Delahunt of Quincy dies by Denise Coffey. William D. Delahunt, who served 39 years in elected office, including seven terms as representative of the 10th Congressional District, died at home in Quincy on Saturday. Delahunt took office in 1997 and retired 14 years later in 2011. The 82-year-old had health issues for some time, according to Mark Forrest, his former chief of staff. The 10th Congressional District, which no longer exists, covers part of the South Shore and the Cape and Islands. Delahunt was the fiancé of Julie Pagano of Quincy, father of Kirsten Delahunt and John Dunn of Dorchester, and Karen Delahunt Bobrov and Nikolai Bobrov of Milton, grandfather of Maya and Alex Bobrov, and former husband of Katie Delahunt of Hingham. In a statement, Delahunt's family thanked everyone who has given him and our family care and support, and acknowledged all those who stood with him for so many years in his work towards making a difference in the community throughout our country and world. 
While we mourn the loss of such a tremendous person, we also celebrate his remarkable life and his legacy of dedication, service, and inspiration. We could always turn to him for wisdom, solace, and a laugh, and his absence leaves a gaping hole in our family and our hearts, reads the statement. Della Hunt was from Quincy. In a statement released Saturday, U.S. Senator Edward J. Markey, a Democrat from Massachusetts, called Della Hunt a champion for justice, whose work was focused on equality and compassion and helping people. Bill Delahunt understood the unlimited capacity of the human heart to love and nurture, Markey wrote. The Commonwealth and the country are better for Bill Delahunt's vision and service. My deepest condolences go out to his family, his loved ones, and all those whose lives he touched. Forrest, who served as Delahunt's district director for Cape Cod and the Islands when he took office, said the congressman's first job was making sure the Cape and Islands knew he would fight for them in Washington. He came into office after Gary Studs retired from a 24-year term. People from the Cape were cautious about a mainlander representing them in Washington, Forrest said. A Cape Cod tie became a standard part of his wardrobe. You could always pick him out on the floor of the house, Forrest said. He loved the cape. People knew who he worked for and who he advocated for, and people knew where his passion was. Forrest called Delahunt a talented leader who always tried to find consensus, bipartisanship, and collaboration with all of his colleagues. Delahunt brought new energy to the Otis Camp Edwards cleanup, including the preservation of 15,000 acres at the Massachusetts Military Reservation, Forrest said. He was determined to secure the funding for the cleanup. He was a champion of the Cape Cod Land Bank, which had strong opposition from real estate agents and associations. Delahunt came up with a plan everybody could agree on, Forrest said, and the Cape Cod Land Bank was enacted into law, and as a result, thousands of acres were preserved. What's more, the law served as a precursor of the Community Preservation Act. Delahunt helped craft and pass legislation that protects children in international adoption cases and provides paths to citizenship. He was a champion, Forrest said. Our next headline, Pilgrim Decommission Citizen Panel Needs Technical Help by Jeanette Hinkle. As Holtec International, which is the company decommissioning Pilgrim Nuclear Power Station in Plymouth, waits for the state to issue a final determination on its plan to dispose of radioactive wastewater from the shuttered plant in Cape Cod Bay, the water continues to evaporate through Pilgrim stacks. Around 888,000 gallons of wastewater used in plant operations remain. That's down from 1.1 million gallons in January of 2022. Comprising 40,000 gallons in the plant's torus, a donut-shaped pressure suppression chamber, 347,000 gallons in the spent fuel pool, 461,000 gallons in the dryer separator pit and reactor cavity, and 40,000 gallons in other plant systems and piping, according to Holtec. The ultimate fate of Pilgrim's remaining wastewater is uncertain. It must be disposed of either through discharge into Cape Cod Bay, evaporation, or transport to an out-of-state facility before Holtec can demolish the plant and clear the site. What's the background? Well, last year, after fierce and sustained resistance from area residents, fishermen, politicians, and environmental scientists, the state DEP issued a draft denial of Holtec's plan to discharge the plant's contaminated wastewater into Cape Cod Bay, a method of wastewater disposal used at other decommissioned nuclear power plants, including in Fukushima, Japan. In its draft denial, the state environmental agency said Cape Cod Bay is a protected ocean sanctuary under the state's Ocean Sanctuaries Act, which prohibits dumping industrial waste into protected state waters. Holtec representatives have said the state's draft denial derailed the company's plans for disposing of the contaminated wastewater, which was periodically discharged into the bay while the plant was operating, resulting in a years-long delay in decommissioning the plant. Pilgrim Nuclear Power Station, which began generating power for the electric grid in 1972, stopped producing electricity in 2019. The projected date of completion is 2035, having moved from 2027 to deal with the issues associated with water, 
Patrick O'Brien, Director of Government Affairs and Communications for Holtec International, told the Times in an email. But there's no timeline for a final decision from a state agency. Though the state issued its draft denial of Holtec's plan to dispose of the plant's wastewater in Cape Cod Bay last year, the state environmental agency's Seth Pickering said this week there is still no timeline for the final determination's issuance. When the determination is issued, Holtec could appeal, resulting in further delay. Association to Preserve Cape Cod Executive Director Andrew Gottlieb, a member of the Nuclear Decommissioning Citizens Advisory Panel, told the Times that, in the meantime, Holtec is taking advantage of the confusion, the inertia, and the opportunity to evaporate as much water off as they can under the guise of warming their workers. On Monday, Holtec Senior Compliance Manager David Noyes told members of the Nuclear Decommissioning Citizens Advisory Panel that the company plans to remove two 20,000-gallon fuel tanks over the next six weeks that have allowed the company to heat the plant using conventional fuel. The tanks scheduled for removal are the last of seven underground fuel tanks once on the site, according to O'Brien. Without conventional fuel... When outside temperatures drop again, Holtec will likely provide heat for decommissioning workers using immersion heaters that increase the temperature of the wastewater at the plant, but thereby heating the buildings as well. Holtec might not wait for cold weather to re-energize the immersion heaters, which were switched off on March 18th, because the heaters also allow plant workers to dry out waste from the reactor vessel in preparation for disposal more quickly, Noyes told Citizens Advisory Panel members. The time for the drying can be significantly reduced based on elevated temperature of the water. So the ability to be able to heat the water in the spent fuel pool while we package the waste provides significant efficiency improvements to be able to process that waste and stage it, Noyes said this week. The plan would be to energize the heaters again when they're required, either for Class B and C waste processing, which we don't currently have a scheduled date for, or when they're required for the next heating season, he added. Gottlieb criticized Holtec representatives for failing to acknowledge that the immersion heaters also accelerate evaporation of wastewater through the plant's stacks into the surrounding environment, a method of wastewater disposal that he called unacceptable. According to O'Brien, there is some difference in the rate at which process wastewater evaporates when the immersion heaters are used compared to when they're not, but the company hasn't quantified that difference. In 2022, Holtec informed the Citizens Advisory Panel that 650,000 gallons of industrial wastewater had evaporated over the previous two years using heat from the fuel in the pool, according to O'Brien. There were no comments or concerns at that time from the panel, O'Brien said. Some shipment of wastewater is expected. O'Brien, who said evaporation will happen with or without immersion heaters, told the Times that some wastewater will likely need to be shipped for disposal eventually. At some point, you may reach a concentration of non-radiological constituents in a small volume of water that would require shipping, O'Brien said. So, as we've all said from the beginning, it would most likely be a combination of all options. Two years ago, when wastewater levels were over a million gallons, Holtec International's CEO estimated it would cost the company roughly $20 million to ship wastewater from the plant to an out-of-state disposal site. Holtec has been shipping other waste from the decommissioning process to licensed out-of-state facilities over the past few years, reportedly without incident. Gottlieb thinks the company, which recently agreed to pay settlements over alleged mishandling of decommissioning funds and separately mishandling of asbestos during decommissioning work, is trying to reduce costs at the expense of area residents and the environment. By appealing the state's denial of its plan to dispose of contaminated wastewater in Cape Cod Bay, Holtec could delay commissioning until the plant's water has evaporated, saving the company millions, Gottlieb said. They avoid storage costs. They avoid transportation costs, Gottlieb said. They expose the people of Plymouth and the surrounding environment, depending on which way the wind is blowing, to atmospheric radiation. But they save money, which means they increase the bottom line profit, which means they've done a good job from Holtec's perspective. Jim Lampert, 
Chair of the Nuclear Decommissioning Citizens Advisory Panel, said that other nuclear plants, including one in Vermont, have successfully disposed of contaminated wastewater by shipping it out of state. Lampert's preferred disposal method. But he and Gottlieb acknowledged that the Citizens Advisory Panel, composed of volunteers that meet once every two months, has no authority over decommissioning decisions. Gottlieb said the group doesn't even have the resources or collective experience needed to vet the information that Holtec provides at their meetings. You have a company as your primary entity over which you're supposedly exerting some oversight, but it's also your primary source of information and it has demonstrated a stunning lack of transparency, respect, or concern for the local interests that exist to make sure this gets done expeditiously, safely, and properly, Gottlieb said. If the advisory panel were to be given resources by the Commonwealth, technical resources that it could use to hire and rely on to critically evaluate the progress and information Holtec's providing, that would go some distance, he said adding that he plans to make that request to Governor Maura Healy's office in coming weeks. Important note for travelers taking an extra day who might have uh, decided that the, uh, the weekend holiday uh, extends to Monday. Born Bridge, one lane each way Monday night, that's tonight, for pavement repair by Zane Razak. U.S. Army Corps of Engineers New England District contractors will make pavement repairs on the Bourne Bridge from 8 p.m. Monday tonight until 5 a.m. Tuesday tomorrow morning. During this time, travel lanes on the Bourne Bridge will be reduced to one lane of traffic in each direction, according to to a notice from the Army Corps of Engineers. Work is weather dependent and is in coordination with the state DOT's ongoing work at the Bourne Rotary, according to the notice. No wide loads will be allowed to cross the bridge while the lane restrictions are in place. The Bourne Bridge is one of two bridges for vehicle traffic crossing the Cape Cod Canal connecting drivers from the mainland to Cape Cod. From the Cape and Islands section, New Barnstable Village Firehouse before voters soon. Q&A on April 13th by Heather McCarran. Barnstable Fire Department officials are moving ahead with the effort to gain voter support for a proposed new firehouse. Fire district officials are currently negotiating with a firm to do the architectural and engineering design, Barnstable Fire Chief Chris Beal said Thursday. The pricing should be finalized by early April, Beal said. Money to pay for the preparatory work for a new firehouse will be sought at the annual Barnstable Fire District meeting on May 8th. The preparatory work is expected to take about nine months. Fire officials intend to bring building designs with cost estimates to district voters next spring. Beale is planning an informal presentation about the proposed firehouse from 10 a.m. to noon on April 13th at Sturgis Library at 3090 Main Street in Barnstable. The department will likely hold another information session with the Barnstable Village Association before the annual district meeting, Beale said. What approvals have occurred so far? Well, in February, the Barnstable Fire District Prudential Committee voted to accept a recommendation by the Fire Station Building Needs Committee to build a new fire station serving the Barnstable Fire District. The district, one of five in town, covers about 14 square miles, including about 5,500 residents in Barnstable Village in Cumaquid, along with most of the Independence Park industrial development and other industrial areas. The recommendation for a new station grew out of a feasibility study looking at the department's present and future needs and then the options to address them. After looking at four options, the Building Needs Committee proposes demolishing the 2,000-square-foot Barnstable Water Department office structure that was built in 1940 at 1841 Finney's Lane and replacing it with a new fire station for the Barnstable Fire District. The Water Department and district offices would take over the existing fire station, part of which would be repurposed as an 1,800-square-foot community space for annual district meetings, village functions, and other community uses. Moving operations to Finney's Lane would provide ample space to meet the fire department's needs, with about two and a half acres to build a station that can house the fleet of vehicles and boats, plus existing staff and anticipated staff additions, according to Beale. Next story from the Cape Cod Times, dated today, April 1st of 2024. How to fly a drone 
over the Bourne Rotary. And no, this is not an April Fool's joke. This is written by Steve Heslip. A circle is considered the perfect shape in geometry, a great concept for ancient Greek mathematicians. But anyone who's driven through the Bourne Rotary on a summer weekend would beg to differ. Its cousin, the Sagamore Rotary, was consumed in October of 2006 by then-Governor Mitt Romney's pet project, the Sagamore Flyover. This gave anxious drivers a straight shot down Route 3 over the Sagamore Bridge to Cape Cod. The Bourne Rotary still presents that racetrack feel of tight turns at high speeds for Cape drivers coming and going around the dreaded circle. The bridge replacement plans, when that hallowed day arrives, will do away with a traffic circle. But, in the meantime, more construction. The state's Department of Transportation is working on a fix, improved lane markings, new signage for those who read them, and a better channeling for exiting traffic. As a spring bonus, the work is being done at night, and it will take a pause for the summer months, then finish up by November. The best way to photograph a rotary is from above, close to a satellite view looking straight down. That view does indeed present the traffic circle in all its geometric perfection. In 2024, this visual challenge is easily accomplished with a drone. Contrary to popular belief, a drone pilot can't fire up the props and just go fly away. As an FAA registered aircraft, there are regulations. Day or night, a drone cannot fly over moving vehicles. Flying at night requires a collision light, which is a small strobe like those on plane wings that's visible for three statute miles. So, geared up and ready to go with a good weather forecast, I headed west to photograph the night work. A parking lot near the rotary gave a good angle and was well back from any moving traffic. All systems go, as NASA would say. All, alas, one glaring problem. Um, there was no construction going on that night. Well, practice makes perfect, so I launched anyway. The winds were calm as I hovered between 200 and 300 feet. From above, the notorious circle was glowing in sodium vapor lighting. The experiment was to see how long the drone could hold a time exposure and still produce a sharp image. The image that is shown in the newspaper is one that is from a one-second exposure. Try holding a cell phone steady that long. In the six-second range, the consistency rate dropped, but the drone did make several sharp photos with long light trails. And there are some photos there. I can't really tell what they are. It just looks kind of yellow and bright. In the six-second range, the consistency rate dropped. Eagle-eyed viewers will see some evidence of construction in the image, so another nighttime visit will be needed. But who doesn't like a trip to the Bourne Rotary, day or night? There is one obituary in today's Cape Cod Times of April 1st, a Monday, 2024. It's of Francis Tom McGuire of West Yarmouth, who at the age of 83 passed on March 16th. Tom and his wife, Roberta, resided in West Yarmouth. Tom was born at Norwood Hospital August 24, 1940, in Norwood, Massachusetts. He graduated Mission High School, then attended Catholic University in Washington, D.C. with a degree in education. Following his graduation, he acquired a master's degree in counseling and administration at Northeastern in Boston, Mass., He is survived by his loving wife, Roberta McGuire of West Yarmouth, and his sister, Patricia McGuire of Norwood, Mass. Also survived by many who will miss him dearly. Tom was quite the artist, enjoying and creating exceptional paintings for his loved ones. In his free time, he greatly enjoyed teaching his grandkids how to fish and find clams in beach time with his best friend and wife, Roberta. Traveling was also a passion of Tom's. His favorite vacation spot was Aruba. In lieu of flowers, please make a charitable contribution to St. Jude's Research Children's Hospital. Tom will be greatly missed by his family and friends. Our next headline, CDC issues warning about deadly bacterial infection by a Jean named Forbes of USA Today. 
The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has issued an alert to healthcare providers about bacterial infections as a strain of the meningococcal disease begins to circulate within the United States. Meningococcal disease is an illness caused by a bacteria called Neisseria meningitis. While this illness can have severe symptoms, including death, a serious infection, commonly called meningitis, can form in the lining of the brain and spinal cord and bloodstream, according to the CDC. In the alert, the CDC explained that a variant of the Neisseria meningitis Zero Group Y has reported 140 cases in 2024 so far. Although meningitis typically, typically affects infants and young adults, this strand is targeting adults between the ages of 30 to 60 years old. People who are at a higher risk of getting this type of meningitis are black or African Americans or someone who has HIV. There are six types of meningitis serogroups that are known as A, B, C, W, X, and Y. The four groups that are in the U.S. are B, C, W, and Y, the CDC states. Since 2014, the highest number of cases from type Y were reported in 2023, with 422 cases, according to the CDC. In addition, Virginia is currently dealing with a statewide outbreak from the meningococcal disease type Y. Since June of 2022, there have been 35 confirmed cases of meningococcal disease associated with this particular outbreak, including six deaths, according to the Virginia Department of Health. The two types of infections that can stem from meningococcal disease are meningococcal meningitis and meningococcal septicemia, also known as meningococcosemia, which is a bloodstream infection, according to the CDC. Symptoms to look out for in meningitis include fever, headache, a stiff neck, nausea, vomiting, photophobia, and altered mental status. Symptoms of meningococcal bloodstream infection include cold hands and feet, diarrhea, fear, fever and chills, fatigue, rapid breathing, severe aches and pains and vomiting, and in advanced stages of the infection, a dark purple rash may appear. And in our half-hour reading of today's Cape Cod Times, we will run down best of the best Cape High School boys hockey all-stars. First team, Chase Field from Barnstable. Dominic Dom Bonito from Bourne. James Kroll from Bourne. Ty Kelly from Bourne. Chris Shanahan from Falmouth. Nate Averill from Martha's Vineyard. Zach Coelho from Nauset. Logan Poulin from Nauset. Colin Ward from Nauset. Brady Meyer from St. John Paul II. Christopher Cardillo from Sandwich. Jack Connolly from Sandwich. Second team, Ian DeVito from Barnstable. Caleb Keene from Bourne. Jackson Pomborg from Bourne. Andrew Popovich from Dennis Yarmouth CCT CCA. Eddie Leary from Falmouth. Hunter Johnson from Martha's Vineyard. Kellen McAleese out of St. John Paul II. Liam Monahan out of St. John Paul II. John Valiga from St. John Paul II. Shane Corcoran from Sandwich. Harrison Delman from Sandwich. Dylan McCabe from Sandwich. Avery Richardson from Sandwich. And honorable mentions, Andrew Crapo from St. John Paul II. Bobby Lawson from St. John Paul II, Finn Ballard from Upper Cape, Charlie Carroll from Upper Cape, and Zephan Johnson from Upper Cape. Sandwich Boys Lacrosse wins season opener in overtime. It was Sandwich beating Situate 6-5. In other high school action, it was Mansfield 12, Nauset 9, Nantucket 17, Martha's Vineyard 1. In girls lacrosse, Nauset 17, Mashby 6, Nantucket 16, Martha's Vineyard 1, Nantucket 18, Plymouth North, Plymouth North 5, and in baseball, Martha's Vineyard 10, Nantucket 0. 
And with that, we've come to the end of our reading of the Cape Cod Times for April 1st of 2024. This is your reader, Eric, saying be well, be safe. Remember our veterans. Bye for now.